Hello and welcome to the Business Today Show. I'm Uday Mukherjee. I've got a special guest for you on the show today, one of the great entrepreneurs of India who turned a family business or broke away from a family business to create what is one of the most enduring FMCG brands the country has seen over the last few decades. The one and only Harsh Mariwala, chairman of Marico, is with me today. Harsh, it's uh, well, great to see you on the show and uh, wonderful to catch up after such a long time. Thank you, thank you Uday and uh, great talking to you after a long, long time but uh, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you and you know, the first question I want to ask you is, you know, there's so much to talk about with you but on reflection, how do you assess your own career in the last four decades and how it's panned out? I mean, if you were told as a young man that this is how it will pan out, would you say that on reflection you would say, I would take it, the lot that I've had, what I've created over the last few decades? In short, the answer is yes, but uh, let me go delve a little deeper in terms of what I had expected of myself and how it has turned out. So, first of all, when I was in college, I'm just a graduate. I have not yeah. done anything beyond uh, my BCom, Bachelor of Commerce, and uh, I was forced to join into the family business. I was absolutely clear that I was not going to work for anybody else and I had to run my own business. So, from that point of view, full marks, I never worked for anybody else. And I joined the family business at, uh, at a very young age of 40, uh, 20, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I built this business of consumer products virtually from a scratch. So I think that was my first experience in, uh, in uh, building a business. And it has been very, very rich because I had to learn everything from the bottom. Uh, it was a completely family manager organization. There were no professionals, so nobody would teach me. We were not in consumer products. Uh, so I had to start from virtually from the bottom. I had to travel into rural areas, appoint distributors, stay with distributors in small towns where there were no hotels. When we appointed an ad agency, I mean, the first thing I said, I want to spend one week with you in terms of how advertising is created. So I think that experience of learning everything from the bottom has really helped me in terms of understanding how things work at the bottom. And from then on the business grew and a lot of issues to do with the family, large family, my father, three of my uncles and then followed by five of my cousins in the same company made it very complex. So how do you untangle yourself in a, in a large family was a big challenge for me which uh, I took two to three years. I had to show a lot of patience, but ultimately that also worked yeah. out and that led to formation of Marico in the year 1990, uh, which gave me a fantastic uh, opportunity to build a culture of uh, FMCG company, uh, recruit the right talent and then over a period of time scale the business. So all in all, I have made many, many, many mistakes, many mistakes, but uh, it's been very rewarding. I wish I could have, uh, somebody could have taught me how not to make some of the mistakes, but net-net I don't have any regrets. I think overall I'm feeling good that I was able to start from a scratch and build a company of good repute and then ultimately pass it on to, to a professional. So the company has turned from an owner-managed company to a strategic investor-driven yeah. company. No, you should not have any regrets, Harsh. And I've been reading all of what you said in this wonderful book, Har <laughs> Harsh Realities, which I spent the weekend reading. And it's such a wonderfully written, written book. My compliments to you. But, you know, you in that book, too, you mentioned this fact thank that you, uh, you tried to get into business schools, but you failed to get, uh, uh, but you failed to get admission out there. And in the book, you say that it's a, it's a blessing in disguise that you did not get in. <laughs> why did you say that? Why do you say that? You are absolutely right. I tried getting into a business school in India. I wanted to go abroad but my father said no and my father was wise enough not to allow me to go abroad because I would have come back and joined the family business in a, and I would have been very, very frustrated because it was a typically family managed business. There were no systems, there were no professionals. So the fact that I had to learn everything from the bottom, uh, I think that really helped me and you know if I had come back. Uh, after doing my MBA, I would have been much more frustrated uh, and not gone through the learning curve which I did uh, uh, because I was not educated uh, in terms of postgraduate uh, MBA qualification. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's worked out well in my favor. I don't know why my father said no, maybe he thought I'll never come back. 
maybe it's what I'll get married to somebody else and <laughs> stay there. I don't have any idea, but mm -hmm. you know, those days you were far more obedient as kids, and I I couldn't <laughs> say no to my father. Then, I mean, if you ask me today, my children, if they, if I say I no, they will just rebel and you know do things which they want to do it on their own. But those days it was very different. Yet, uh, when you went about setting up the company from scratch, uh, Mariko, uh, the, the company that you immersed yourself in, you actually sought out people with exactly that pedigree, all those IIT, IIM graduates, and you recount all of that in your book one by one. All of them came from the best business schools and they had very good pedigree in terms of the companies they worked for. So what you did not have yourself, but you sought out in the kind of people that you populated your company with. Why? So you're absolutely right, you know, because I, when I started, I started learning things by referring to uh, some of my friends, uh, talking to some consultants, uh, highly, shall I say, qualified individuals who worked in very good organizations and that experience of interacting with thought leaders, with very good quality professionals really influenced me a lot in my formative years. So I was absolutely clear that if I had to run an FMCG business, I have to have the best quality talent, best quality in terms of qualifications, attitude and also overall performance. So uh, I think that uh, that belief I developed over a period of few years in my formative years in terms of investing in talent and I think that has played a very, very important role in the success of Marico. And I always looked at individuals who were better than me because uh, I was not a functional expert and you know. I had to recruit the best quality marketing professional. I had to recruit the best quality sales professional. And if they've already worked in this in this sector, uh, then I mean they will bring their experience and they'll be able to add value. And uh, I think many entrepreneurs think that they know it all. And that has been the biggest, I would say, uh, mistake they make. They don't try to recruit somebody who's better than me themselves. And I had a different viewpoint that I have to recruit better then what I am in that particular functional area and that person should be better than me so that I am able to empower that individual and also delegate to them uh, and not abdicating my responsibility. I am equally responsible for delegating but uh, it's easy to empower them because they are far more capable than, than yourself. Mm. There's an interesting anecdote in your book as well where Uday Kotak, one of your contemporaries, goes on to say that there are two kinds of companies as he sees it. One is the king and his subjects, uh, family company with the boss thinks he knows everything. And the other is a value driven company where basically all decisions are taken keeping the firm's interests in mind uh, regardless of what the owner thinks. And he puts Mariko in the second category obviously. But, but uh, when you look at the ecosystem today, candidly Harsh, uh, do you see more in the first category or the second category, all these large companies, king and his subjects or value driven? <laughs> so I would say if they are family uh, managed in terms of uh, the leadership, uh, I think they are more in the first category. The biggest problem I find amongst entrepreneurs in India is that they think the company belongs to them. If you are running a company which is a public limited company, you may be the majority shareholder, you may be the promoter, you may be the founder. But that doesn't entitle you to call yourself owner, especially when you have diluted your ownership to many other shareholders. It's not right to say that this is my company. And I think that is the starting point. You know, if entrepreneurs say that this is my company, I can't say this Marico is mine. Okay, I have a majority holding, that's fine. But it is not my company. And I think I have to be completely, I have to realize that I have to look at all the stakeholders and all the, even the s smallest of shareholders and I have to look at something which is in the interest of the company and not in the interest of promoters. Unfortunately, I think many promoters think that their interests come first and followed by the interest of the company, which is not right. Mm. You know, you've taken Mariko to a certain level, Harsh, but now what is the legacy that you leave behind at Mariko? Because the turf has changed quite considerably, as you will recognize yourself better than anyone, that when you were bringing the company up, your challengers were, or you were up against the challenge of giants like Hindustan Unilever or Dabur's of the world. But today, there are smaller, nimbler players like 
you know, the Nikas, the Mama Earths, the Good Glam groups who are nipping away with small, smaller products, but they're chipping away at the edge and plugging gaps in the market. Is this a very, very different kind of an FMCG universe that Marico has to contend with today? So let me uh, go a little bit more into this subject. Uh, I think the overall FMCG until a few years back was known as one of the most defensive sectors in the sense that very little of discontinuity was impacting the sector. But what has happened, what you mentioned just now about uh, emergence of what is known as D2C brands, direct to consumer brands, uh, is a big disruption for FMCG. Some of the entry barriers which existed earlier entry barriers in terms of distribution infrastructure creation. In the past, you know, you had to distribute your products into thousands, lakhs of outlets to, to get a certain scale. Uh, you had to advertise on mass media like television or press and that required big budgets. But now, in case of D2C brands, what has happened is you can do digital marketing you need not advertising on mass media, you don't need to create a distribution network, you can sell it through e-commerce places. So those entry barriers have vanished and on top of that there are many funders who are wanting to fund you. Uh, of course you need to have a good proposition in terms of uh, demand creation. But we have seen brands like Mama Earth and many many brands which have uh, emerged in the last few years. Uh, mainly because the entry barriers have vanished uh, or reduced and uh, as far as Marico is concerned uh, there are two ways of looking at it or any FMCG one is to look at those entrants from a threat perception that they will impact me in my core business another is to look at it from an opportunistic lens uh, so Marico we have done the second part which we have uh, viewed this discontinuity from an opportunity angle and considering that we have acquired three brands which are D2C brands. The first brand we acquired was Beardo which is in beards uh, or beard related products. Second was Just Herbs which is in personal care and we just made an application uh, healthy foods through true elements and on top of that we also have two or three of our own D2C brands. Uh, the thing is not to have the same mindset to manage the FMCG business as you manage the D2C business. So we have put all these three brands plus our own brands at a different location, manned by a different team, much younger in, uh, in age and they, they have to work nimbly like a, a small outfit and I think the key thing is can you scale them up? So Beardo, for example, this year we expect to do 100 crore business. And over a period of next two years, we expect that the D2C brands of ours would, uh, as including this three acquisitions, would add up to about 500 crores of business. You know, many of them will have some stumbling blocks. And uh, you speak a lot in your book about failures. And how important has that been in your career, learning from the failures, because there have been many. Could you recount one or two instances where you failed and where you actually got up and managed yeah, to actually sure. learn I, I a can lot give you from many more. Uh, that stumble? Yeah. Like, uh, mm -hmm. Unless you experiment, unless you fail, you not learn. And there are limitations to market research. No amount of market research is going to give you all the answers. And there is no shortcut to actually launching products and testing out amongst the consumers because uh, market research will not give you all the answers. So it's important for organizations to take that risk um, and study uh, the reaction, the consumer reaction, not only to the product, but the product, the brand name, the packaging, the pricing and so on, you know. So having said that, uh, many times, you know, we said that you have to do consumer insight, you have to understand consumer what they want and market research has its own set of limitations and there is no shortcut to actually launching a product or on a, even even on a limited scale on a prototype basis and I'll give you one example uh, about mm -hmm. 8 or 10 years back we identified a good opportunity to go into baked snacks under the brand name Safola. Uh, at that time there were no baked snacks uh, we were the first ones to identify that opportunity and launch a product, Bake Snacks, under the brand Safola. 
but the biggest mistake we made was that we thought that it is under the brand name Safola, so health is very important. So we gave a preference of health over taste. Uh, the product was average in terms of taste, but when it went to the consumer, they want a tasty snack. It's an impulsive product. If you are sitting in the afternoon with a cup of tea or a drink in the evening, you want something which is tasty and just not healthy. So the consumer rejected the product. But there was a huge learning for us uh, in that failure because after a few years, we decided to go into Safola Oats. So we launched Safola Oats, plain oats. We got some market share and then through consumer inciting, we realized that uh, Indians like savory breakfast and they don't like uh, sweet breakfast. So can we do what Maggie did to noodles in terms of providing a range of savory oats? Um, and we then profiled uh, the taste for each and every state. Uh, we went overboard on taste for each state. For example, in Tamil Nadu, we had a Pongal uh, masala oats and some other states where they require much more sweeter or a much more chili version of uh, or much more hotter version of oats. We designed our product and that product has been a huge success. We have an 80% market share in that category. We ourselves have created, which is over a period of last four or five years has become 300 crore category. But that learning from the failure of our baked snacks, prototype in Bombay market played a huge role in going overboard on taste when we designed the product for Safola Savory Oats. So there is always a silver side to any failure in terms of learning as long as you analyze what went wrong and apply it later in your some other initiative. I, I want to ask you, Harsh, about how, where you would place Kaya in the scheme of things. Because, you know, as Marico goes, a 400 crores market cap after so many years seems to give the impression that it has not quite ended up where you envisaged it would end up. Would you concede that Kaya could have been bigger, better, smarter? Have there been any mistakes along the way there? Uh, in short, the answer is yes. I could have, we could have done a better job. Uh, we were uh, doing better and then all of a sudden this pandemic came in. So last two years we've had a terrible time in terms of closure of our clinics. But now, come this year from April onwards, things have bounced back and uh, the business has improved. It has gone back to our earlier levels and we have a new CEO. But we have made mistakes. It's a completely different business. It's a very complex business compared to an FMCG business. It's a combination of three different businesses, hospitality, retail, and healthcare. And you have to find the right balance between these three. Uh, we have made some mistakes in the past, clearly, which has put us back. But to answer your question, could it have been better? The answer is clearly yes. We should have done a much better job, accelerated by the pandemic, which had its own impact on our business, especially in the last two years. I want to ask you, uh, Harsh, I mean, the other very significant thing that you've done in your career is almost at the peak of it, you said uh, that I'm going to relinquish the CEO's chair and give it off to a professional, which is something which is very rare in family run uh, or originally family run businesses. Uh, what prompted you to do that, A, and how do you see succession at Marico from here on? I mean, your son is engaged in the business, uh, but is there a time that you can see that Rishabh might be the one who takes over from uh, Saugata? <laughs> so good question. You know, I think when I, when I took that step in the year 2014, I had not thought that I will relinquish my responsibility at that particular point of time. At some stage I had to. But uh, it just arose that, you know, at that time my current CEO, uh, Saugata Gupta, he was working with me for 10 years. Uh, he expressed desire, his desire to to be in my shoes and I discussed that with my board at that time and we have a very active board, very participative board and the board felt that it was good that uh, we needed a new blood in, in Marico because I had steered the company for many, many years. Um, so the board felt that I should give, give him that opportunity and, and step down and it will also pave the way for succession for me. Um, I think the starting point was that my mindset was that the company does not belong to me and the organization's interest comes first and then my personal interest. So though I was not ready to step down, I stepped down in the interest of the company. 
of course society meant to that uh, the children and these days it's a very hierarchical society uh, children would inherit uh, me uh, but at that time my son was not ready to some extent and he uh, he was also not that keen to uh, to run an operating company so i took that step uh, but looking back it has been a very good step because you know i think it has freed me in terms of doing a lot of new things which i had never thought i would be able to do if i was running the company and um, i think our role as promoters has changed earlier it was a promoter managed company now it is more as a strategic investor driven company where we are the biggest investors so i don't operate the company on day to day basis but i am not i am aware of what's happening i have review meetings with the management and the team i may be spending 2 3 days a month on marico but day to day operations nothing comes to me for decision as far as my son is concerned he is already running a very successful uh, investment office which is an exceedingly well he has found his calling in that particular area so i don't think he would like to step into marico shoes but uh, if you ask me what would happen over a period of time um, i think i would like to step down as chairman once not in the immediate future but over a period of time and i am i am grooming him to be the chairman of marico so he would be uh, something like what i am doing but not an operational full time role as a managing director in in marico but he would take care of the the family's interest in terms of a strategic investor finally uh, harsh there's a very interesting chapter in your book called angels and predators uh, it's wonderfully framed uh, phrased as well the, and you talk about the time when as a young upstart marico hul got very upset and wanted to buy you and that offer was rebuffed today uh you may i mean as your career ends you might have another situation where these days the big predator on the block in any industry practically is gautam adani and he happens to be a big competitor with adani wilmer for marico if adani came to marico and said i want to buy that company would your answer be the same absolutely same i am very clear that i have created this company uh from a perpetuity point of view and not to sell the company forget about adani if i want to sell it there may be some other buyers also and there have been many shall i say approaches made to me in in the past and i have always said no so that question of uh, selling out uh, doesn't arise uh, number 2 i am preparing the company from a long term point of view in terms of uh, the role of board uh what kind of decisions the board will take over a period of time so all the initiatives to drive perpetuity within uh within marico are being taken today and if you look at the history of uh, procter and gamble or lever i mean they started as family owned companies but they have survived over a period of time so i am viewing myself from that kind of a uh, point of view in terms of marico continuing in future Uh, the fact that we have a 60% shareholding the promoter and nobody can we are not vulnerable in terms of uh, hostile takeover or somebody buying a stake because because you have a minority stake well harsh we'll have to leave it there but congratulations on a spectacular career and a terrific uh, uh, book as well and you're a great inspiration to so many entrepreneurs across the country wish you all the best uh, for of uh, the remainder of your life and uh, what you've done thank you then uh, great talking to you thank you very much for your time today